Adaptability, I think, honestly, is, is the most important thing for companies, especially as they grow. It takes, it takes time to build a business. It takes time, especially to build a SaaS business. And I think the, the biggest success stories, whether it's Salesforce or Figma, are those that just had the time to put one foot in front of the other and to adapt and to talk to customers and be relentless and to learn, iterate, and evolve. And so adaptability, honestly, is the most important thing we look for in our people. It's the most important thing I look at when I'm looking at companies to invest in because the world is changing faster than ever before. TikTok's only two years really into its US existence. The growth has been phenomenal in two years. I just read a stat the other day that um, more time is spent on TikTok than all other social platforms combined as of last month, two years in. So adaptability is everything. The way we work is changing really fast. Welcome to Growth Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? You wish your employees were ever evolving, maybe even a little bit more adaptable. Well, today we're going to talk about creating an adaptable culture. When you have uh, people that are willing to be a little bit more flexible and look for innovation and embrace that and, and really seek out these changes instead of resist them, you have an adaptable culture. So today we talk with uh, a special guest, the CEO of Brand Live, really powerful uh, virtual video, um, re really kind of complex things that we talk about inside the virtual video stuff. But Sam Colbert Heil and I discuss an adaptable culture and what that means for you to have uh, the kind of place where people are willing to embrace new ideas and people are willing to actually be adaptable. When you are leading people through innovation, you want to make sure people have this adaptable culture and they are really embracing these new ideas. That is the key to success. Well, if you are curious about, you know, how do you take your leadership to the next level? And how do you take your team's leadership to the next level? Then I want you to check out the free training we've put together for you. Just go to genehammett.com forward slash training. It's three specific skills that as leaders, you must be able to demonstrate. I won't tell you what they are today because in a four minute video, we unpack these three skills that will really help you in today's fast paced workforce. You can share this with your team. You can you know, sit down and discuss these three skills, but you want to know what they are. The research, I share with you, gives you exactly what you need to be able to do and perform inside all cycles of leadership. All you have to do is go to genehammett.com forward slash training. Now here's the interview with Sam. Sam, how are you? I am great. We're gonna I am have a great. great. Thank you for asking. We're going to have a great time today. We're going to talk about you know what really makes your company special and what makes you guys grow so fast. Uh, tell us a little bit about your company, Brand Live. Great to be here. Thank you for having me, first and foremost. Brand Live is this um, kind of amazing little business that we've that we've built out over the last couple of years that focuses on helping marketers and leaders at, at midsize and above companies tell their story using video. So we we come at the problem very much focused on how companies communicate. Could be an internal all hands meeting, could be a webinar, could be a webinar series, could be an investor day, could be the most important customer conference of their year and to use the power of video to, to reach out and connect and engage their audience in ways that are more consistent with what's on television. So we look back, we had this crazy pandemic growth where we went from eight people to over a hundred. And we asked ourselves last summer as we were thinking through this, um, what are the elements of a virtual event that sustained post pandemic? What are the types of meetings and experiences that are better virtually? And we realized that most of the best experiences on Brand Live, most of the best moments were actually those that told a story that elicited some sort of emotion that stirred butterflies in your stomach or made the hair on your arm stand up. And we started to really reshift our focus on helping marketers tell those stories. And we found that, um, that by mimicking the formula folks use in Hollywood, by, by taking a 30 minute to 60 minute experience and making it interesting, we could engage folks who are dealing with the boringness of work in this era. So if I had to summarize the, the business in a nutshell, we realized that the future of work and the future of marketing is um, really trying to figure out how to be at the intersection of this 
amazing content that's being created and consumed every day, whether it's TikTok or the 12 streaming platforms you subscribe to, and the boringness of work. And we just hope that the work world looks and feels more like the world of content we're consuming outside of work. And if we believe that, then over the next three to five years, marketers are going to want to use video to tell their stories, to engage their customers, to make communities out of their people, or you know, make people uh, want to to be part of whatever they're building. And video has that unique power and we think it's the future. So that's why we're here. I want to give you a chance to, to expand on that a little bit more. You give us a lot of detail, but I'm a creator. You probably work with a lot of people who are creators. Maybe they don't even think of themselves as creators, but what do you wish creators know or knew that they don't know? Well, there's a couple of things. I mean, first off, the, the average the average uh, uh, person in, in the world is under 30. 30 is the midpoint. And the average age of the workforce is 37. The average age of brand live is 29. So we're not that far from the, the world's average, but millennials and Gen Z and, and young people honestly are driving a lot of this behavior change. And they, they think differently. I mean, they're consuming so much content, whether it's Mr. Beast on YouTube, whether it's their Instagram reels, whether it's the TikToks they get sent. I mean, TikTok went viral because it's funny content in three minute chunks that can be shared via text. So the the idea that any company is going to have a generation of leaders, 30 and below, who are becoming or will assume leadership potential over the next 15 years, it's really hard to imagine that they're not going to want to use the creative tool set that you're alluding to as a creator. And that's how we're thinking about the, the next decade as this way for content creators to leverage what they're doing outside of work in work. The hard part is, as you might know, is coming up with the content. 30 to 45 minutes is a lot of time to fill. And so the, the, um, the problem is actually teaching people the formula to fill 30 to 45 minutes well. So we've studied it intensely. We've looked at segment-based approaches with, with you know, musical themes and a mix of live and pre-recorded to solve the problem. And we're borrowing from the best creators, those who do this a lot and frequently. So... Ellen, Oprah, Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, people who create a lot, because that's the hard part, the creative part. So that that would be the, the perspective we come to the table and how I would challenge people to think about this. You have to make people want to watch something and make it so good that they're okay watching it the next day or a week later and get the same experience. And that starts with investment and intentionality. It's very impressive what you're doing. And even I commented on the changing light and forgive those that don't have the video version in front of them, but uh, great setup there. You showed me how simple it was and just a little bit of intentionality. Uh, you live by this. So uh, the most unique studio I've ever seen. So kudos to you, Sam. We come here not to talk about video per se, but to talk about how do you create a, a culture and environment where people are adaptable and they evolve quickly. Why is that necessary? I know you, you gave us one example and your company needed to evolve post pandemic. But why is evolving necessary? Well, adaptability, I think, honestly, is, is the most Im important thing for companies, especially as they grow. It takes, it takes time to build a business. It takes time, especially, to build a SaaS business. And I think the, the biggest success stories, whether it's Salesforce or Figma, are those that just had the time to put one foot in front of the other and to adapt and to talk to customers and be relentless and to learn, iterate, and evolve. And so adaptability, honestly, is the most important thing we look for in our people. It's the most important thing I look at when I'm looking at companies to invest in because the world is changing faster than ever before. TikTok's only two years really into its US existence. The growth has been phenomenal in two years. I just read a stat the other day that um, more time is spent on TikTok than all other social platforms combined as of last month, two years in. So adaptability is everything. The way we work is changing really fast. I remember like the pandemic happened and it took a full year for people to start talking about the great resignation. Like that was last summer. This whole quiet quitting trend is a year later. Like this whole way we work and how, how employers and employees come to the same set of ch challenges when it comes to return to work, like those are new things. And so being able to adapt, to listen, to iterate, to get feedback, to, to learn is honestly what we think of as the most important thing for any company. And if you're partnering with companies, it's equally important too, because the assumption that people know what they want, to me, just as a general rule, is 
is not what we're seeing. Most large organizations, most people who are adapting to return to work as an example, don't know exactly what they're looking to do. And so it's all about listening, adapting, and learning. Sam, you lived it recently when you had to change your business looking at post-pandemic, right? You went from a handful of employees to over 100 because people are going virtual. And you had to get people to go, we've got to think differently. It probably wasn't broken at the time, but it sounds like you were pretty innovative in leading the charge. Is that accurate to describe? Your business model wasn't broken? Uh, no, I think, I think honestly, the, the business model that we were focused on during the first year of the pandemic was unsustainable. And there's a couple of reasons why. I mean, we were very focused on virtual events in the beginning. Brand Live got famous or big because we powered the Biden campaign. And as we turned the corner into, I'd say, May, June, July of last summer, we started to realize that a lot of the experiences weren't that good. And we asked ourselves whether virtual events are good enough to continue at the same pace. I mean, their growth was insane. But we kind of came to the conclusion, pinched ourselves and kind of decided that, you know, a lot of these virtual events aren't that amazing. The value of an in-person experience in many cases is higher or, or more important. And um, the planners, the people who put on those events were largely used to in-person experience because they were event planners, first and foremost, that foremost, they were not focused on software. They certainly didn't know what software the service was. So this idea that an event planner wanted to plan virtual events just wasn't true. Um, in fact, they were arguably a, a threat to their existence. And so, <laughs> you know, as we, as we looked at ourselves last summer, I mean, we had, we had several brainstorming sessions. We spent a month to try to put together a point of view, to write the script, so to speak. And we realized that the best meetings and the best events were the ones we needed to replicate. And we went out to kind of put together a list of those things, assuming like we knew. And surveys are inconsistent, so it's really hard to kind of figure out what the best ones are. But we basically just asked our customers and we asked our, our um, project managers, people who are internally focused on the events. And we got this long list of these, these events, the ones that were the, the pinnacle, right? The, the torch bearers. And we went down the list and we started to see that most of the best ones had nothing to do with our software, the feature functionality around the video player. Rather, the, the best events, and they certainly weren't the prettiest, were the ones that had invested into the content, the in-video experience. And that takes a lot to kind of pinch yourself and be like, oh, maybe our product isn't that important. Maybe it's the people who actually like know what they're doing or investing into high production value, good cameras, great lighting, talent. I mean, half of a movie budget or a TV budget, more than half goes to the, the talent. But we're putting together a bunch of boring sessions with no investment in talent curation not nice cameras, not good lighting, looks like a Zoom meeting. I mean, it's little heads and boxes and slides. I mean, there's no slides in the event where the people don't really use slides. TV, you don't see slides. And so we kind of were like, huh, that's really interesting. Like this, this takes the courage to just abandon the kind of current point of view and come up with a new one. And we realized that the best meetings and events were the ones that had the best content. And so we shifted our energy and focus there overnight. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure I would have been able to do that if we didn't have a point of view. Like we weren't asking clients what they wanted because they didn't know. But if you watched as many events as I watched and as our team watched, you knew the ones that were good. And um, I think I think the pandemic period, to your point, it, it was unsustainable. And so we were just searching for ways to use video to tell narratives and stories at work. And that happens to be high frequency marketing events across large companies. And that's how we got here. Kind of accidental, to be honest. Now, Sam just talked about, you've got to have a point of view. Now, I think that's a really interesting choice because I believe what he means behind this is you've got to stand for something. You've got to know what makes you you. You got to know what your truth is. Now, those are some big questions, but if you don't know what you stand for, how do you expect everyone else to know what you stand for? Because the point of view is not just for you to understand. The point of view is for you to be able to communicate for others so that when you do go through an adaptable you know, time period where people have to evolve, we have to innovate, they're willing to be that adaptable culture that we've been talking about here. You've got to have a point of view and other people have to buy in to what that point of view is. Back to Sam. How do you lead through innovation like this? Well, our business is really visual. So a lot of what we've led by is trying to do things with our own tools, trying to create our own events, our own webinars, our own in-person experiences, our own hybrid events. We had a hybrid all hands meeting today, 45 people upstairs on the sixth floor. Um, and it was wonderful. And 
as much as it as much as it like is amazing to lead through client experiences i think the thing that i've found the most success with and what we're proudest of in many respects is using our own tools and our own technology to 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 test to tweak to iterate to to be the procrastinator to to build the the solution to the problem because it is hard and it in theory is the best competitive advantage we have leveraging our own teams and our own tech to try to figure this out as we go, assuming it's going to take a long period of time to figure it out. So I go back to that Figma example is a great one. I mean, they started in 2013. The business took five years to really have what I would describe as the, you know, Photoshop Illustrator kind of feature set. I don't think the revenue really grew that fast until about two years ago. So 2013, 2022, it takes a long time. So I, I don't know. I think the best way to lead is to learn by doing and to use your own products and your own teams to try to learn how to do it yourself so you can teach others. You've got to have a lot of great people who have this ability to adapt quickly because I, I know my teenager is one of them. He does not want to adapt. He doesn't want to change uh, places at the table, places when we sit in front of the TV. He eats his food the same way every time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of humorous, but a lot of younger people aren't as adaptable as they need to be inside of a work environment. Are you having challenges with this work younger crowd? And how do you actually reach them so that they buy into these, you know, being adaptable? We have honestly struggled to get our youngest employees into the office. I just assumed that young people were lonely. They tended to live by themselves. And so as the pandemic kind of turned into the 2021, 20. 22 plan to return to work. I just assumed the people who are loneliest would want to rush back into the office. And it hasn't uh, played out that way. We have seen on average that people who got ahead pre-pandemic in an office want to be back in the office. That tends to over-index to white men. It also tends to over-index to people who are in their 30s and up. We've really struggled to get young people to really think about how they work and they're definitely, I'm not surprised on this quiet quitting trend, honestly, because they are definitely much more schedule-based than uh, certainly I was when I was young. I mean, I was definitely, I was definitely like a workaholic. And I know that in this era, there are, there are some downsides to that, but there's definitely much more structure in how we communicate to our employees. And what we found is that you need to over-communicate. You need to do someone in a way that's generally the same way that they communicate outside of work, which is video-based. You need to make the content good, or at least the stories that, whether it's an all hands meeting or a departmental meeting, or even just an AMA, which is like an ask me anything session, so good that it's worth a rewatch. Or if you if you wanted to you know, hone in on a particular question, or if you're on vacation or you're busy, because we're all busy, um, it's just as good to watch the next day. And so, you know, we found that we have to communicate more than we thought. We tried the, the, um, the carrots approach, Thursday, uh, happy hours, Tuesday, free lunch. We have a barista at the office. We have Friday um, breakfast club. And, uh, you know, I was, I was just really excited that everyone would be back in the office. Again, I'm, I'm the CEO. I got ahead previously, became CEO, right, from how I worked. So I want work to look like the way it used to work. Um, but most people don't. Most people, most people um, are enjoying, especially if they got ahead post-pandemic, they're enjoying the environment with which they got ahead in. And so um, the carrots haven't really worked. I'm at about 40 to 45% on Tuesdays, Wednesday, Thursdays. Fridays, no one comes in. Monday is sprinkling. And I was hoping to be at like 60, 70, 80%. And it's a, you know, it's a flexible culture. We say be here half the time, 50%. We don't pick the days or prescribe them, but the attendance is much lower than I was hoping. And so, you know, I think it comes back to some combination of carrots and sticks. We haven't figured out what the right stick is, whether it's like work with your team, pick a day where you can all be here together. But I will say this, it depends on your business. If you're a creative business like ours, we think we benefit from being in the office, but our development team is never going to be in the office full time because they don't benefit really from being in the office together. There's no creative component to the development team's yeah. tasks. So, you know, approach each circumstance based on your culture, your teams, your industry, and, you know, the out outcomes and goals you're looking for. But it has not been easy to your point. It's been a lot harder than I expected. As Sam just talked about quiet quitting. Now, you may have heard this before. You may have seen episodes that we've done, but it's something that you want to make sure that you are tuning into. In a nutshell, it is people who are doing the bare minimum 
or just doing their job responsibilities as they move forward work. They're just doing what they're responsible to do and nothing more. They're drawing some boundaries. Now, I get that. But one way to, to be able to do that is to be a more powerful leader. And to do that, you've got to be able to communicate more efficiently. You've got to have a vision they want to buy into. You've got to have a purpose. You've got to create a, pl- a workforce a workforce of meaning. Got a little tongue tied there. And you want to make sure that you're able to coach them along this journey. And there's a lot of stuff inside there, but I mentioned this to you because you want to get all those things right. If you have any questions about what it takes to overcome quiet quitting, make sure you reach out to me. My website is genehammond.com. I'd love to talk to you about what's going on in your business. Back to Sam. I would imagine you have your finger on the pulse of a lot of data behind what video is doing right now across businesses that allow people to buy in to what's going on and whether they be customers. What is the most interesting data that you could share with me? I'm not looking for everything, but just like something that really stands out to you as interesting. Well, most people, people don't join a meeting or an event until the third minute doesn't cross over that point, especially if there's registration and the experience, think webinar, um, until minute three. I thought that was really interesting. Um, still half the traffic's on the phone, uh, which made sense during the pandemic because people were multitasking, if that makes sense. You'd have your laptop up and your phone. You could walk around the house, you'd go to the bathroom. Remember, these are not Zoom experiences. These are one to many, usually 200 people and up. So it's a little less having to be always on, a little bit more about how you absorb, learn, digest content. So um, I thought those two points were really interesting. I thought that the, I was shocked by the mobile stuff. I mean, it's like 50 to 60%. And depending on the industry, it can even be higher. It's very socioeconomic in some respects. We have some clients who are a little bit lower, fo- focus on you know di- different, different buyer personas. And so it's actually more mobile on the lower economics, which I didn't, I didn't expect, if that makes any sense. And I said this to a client once and he said, well, you don't understand. They don't, in some cases, they don't own a computer. So um, it really got me thinking differently about the problems we're trying to solve and how good communicators can make a difference. I do think that on average, uh, 70% of the meetings and events on Brand Live are less than an hour. So they're 30 minutes to 40, 45 minutes to an hour, the exact length of a television show, which was higher than I expected. I think we hear virtual events and we think multi-day conferences, but the people who are doing this well are actually doing it in shorter form. Not a TikTok, not three minutes, not a masterclass, not eight minutes but 30 to 60 minutes, kind of the length of an important meeting. Um, so these are all little morsels that I've collected over the last year, but it's remarkably very, consistent. Meaning very it's not interesting, that much. Sam. <laughs> I yeah. appreciate you being here and, and really giving us some of the view of what you're seeing on the back side of your business and, and really just looking at you know, adaptable employees and how you get them to, to make that shift. Thank you for that wisdom. Thank you for having me. Wow, what a great interview. I love how they're using video to engage people. Now, this company is really impressive with their growth. They've been through many different challenges and changing their their business models through the pandemic, before pandemic. But what I really took away from this is you want to make sure that you as a leader are creating a space for people to have an adaptable culture. It really does matter that if you want to listen to people, you want to engage them, and you can do that through your the way you've always done it or you can do it using some new tools available to you through video so a lot of that was kind of combined together with today's message of how to create an adaptable culture i appreciate you listening in here when you think of leadership and you think of growth think of growth think tank as always with courage we'll see you next time